created to know and enjoy God. You were called to be in community so that you can become all that God desires you to be. God designed you with a purpose so you can be the difference in this world. And we exist to help you on that journey. Graceway. Welcome to Graceway Online. Hey, I'm Seiko. If you're watching on your TV or computer, be sure to go to graceway.app on your smartphone or take notes and learn more about what is happening at Graceway. We have an excellent service plan for today, so let's get started.
worship this morning. Amen. Come on, let's keep singing together. We'll sing forever, Yahweh. Joanna's going to lead us. Let's keep worshiping.
good, don't it? Amen. And we're going into a time of prayer. You're going to see some prayer requests over my shoulder. We pray because we acknowledge that God is good and his mercy endures. Amen, church. Amen, church. Come on now. We also pray because God listens to us and he responds to us. Amen, church. Amen. Come on, take a moment and check out these prayer requests on the back wall and I'll come back and pray for them, all right? There's folks praying uh, to overcome the flu. There's someone who's recovering from a plane crash. We know that you're the healer, and so we just pray that they recover. You said, if my people who were called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, you'll hear us from heaven, you'll forgive our sins, and you'll heal our land. And so we're coming before you today, Jesus asking you to heal our land. There's so many needs on this board, but we just acknowledge that you're the one who can do it. You're the one who can fix it. You're the one who can heal. You're the one who can deliver. And so, God, there's someone praying the, that their family can just break generational curses. And I, and I pray for that to happen in the name of Jesus. And if there's anyone on the stream or in the room that's dealing with the same thing, God, I just, I pray that your power breaks generational curses in the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Yahweh God. God, I just uh, thank you that we get a chance to come before you and just sing and, and worship and we're going to hear a message a little later and going to have an opportunity to give, but as we do it, I just... Uh, I pray that you're with us, that you're Emmanuel, that you're God with us, and that you just heal and deliver you. Speak to us as we worship you and help us to remember to give you all the praise. It's in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, somebody shout amen in this place. Come on, can we give Jesus a big round of applause in this place? Amen. Come on down, ushers. We're going to take up tithes and offerings. The Bible says give and it will be given back to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. But we don't give to get stuff. We give out of a heart of gratitude. And so I want you to pray over that seed as you give out of a heart of gratitude. All right, we'll sing Jesus, you alone as we do it. Let's keep worshiping, y'all.
I pray for the word that's going to be brought forth. I pray that it falls on good ground. Help us to remember to give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. It's in the matchless name of Jesus. Come on, somebody, shout amen in this place if you believe it. Come on, shout a little louder. Hallelujah. High five your neighbor before you take your seat, y'all. We are so glad you could be here today. Whether it's your first time here or your Graceway family, welcome. If this is your first time, make sure to check out the seat in front of you. You'll find a connect card that you can fill out so we know that you joined us here today. Or if you prefer digital, you can scan the QR code and fill it out by going to graceway.app. Graceway's growth track is today and is a great opportunity for you to learn more about us and for us to learn more about you. We'll meet in room 102 at 12 p.m. for step four, Make a Difference, a session that will show you how you can make an eternal difference in the lives of others. You'll also learn about the multiple serving opportunities we have here at Graceway, hear from our dream team leaders, and take that vital step toward embodying your purpose through service. Next, make sure to join us this Friday for our Good Friday service at 6.30 p.m. This is a family-friendly service where we gather to remember and reflect on the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. Then, invite someone to Easter at Graceway next Sunday, March 31st at 8.30, 10, and 11.30 a.m. We hope you can join us to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's all I got for you this week. To stay informed about all of our upcoming events or to take notes during the service, visit graceway.app. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope to see you next Sunday. Graceway, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. If you're joining us online, thanks for joining us in that way. If I haven't met you, I am the lead pastor here. My name's Tim. Love that you're here. Thanks for being here. Come on, church. Say hello to our first-time guests. We appreciate you for watching us online. Thank you for joining us in that way as well. If you have a Bible, get over to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to continue our new or our current series Everyday Saints, as you get there, man, we got a lot going on. It is Palm Sunday today. We're excited about that. The day that Jesus turns toward Jerusalem, comes into Jerusalem, headed toward false accusation, betrayal, murder, and the redemption of all things. And so we're excited about that. This Friday, Good Friday, 630 in this room so important for you to be a part of that. I want you to come on Easter, but I want you to find out why Easter is necessary before you show up, okay? So Good Friday lets us know the grief and the grit and the hurt and the betrayal and the thing that Jesus is willing to do because he loved you that sets up the fact that the tomb is empty, that all things are made new, that forgiveness and freedom is possible. So I want you to come celebrate, but I want you to actually know what we're celebrating, all right? Good Friday, 6.30 this Friday. And then Easter Sunday, three services, 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. I'll get you out of here in time for brunch or breakfast or whatever you got going on. So I invite you to one of those three services, and I need you to invite somebody else to one of those three services. So let me tell you how that does not sound, all right? Are you ready? Hey, man, I go to church. We got Easter. You should come. Okay, cool. Don't do that. Hey, listen, I go to this phenomenal church. Uh, God's really used it in my life. I would love for you to come and visit. This Sunday, we have three services. Whichever one you want to go to, I'll go to. In fact, uh, what's your favorite drink at Starbucks? Can I just pick you one up? It's going to cost you $87, all right? It's not a big deal. It's worth it. <laughs> Treasures in heaven, no big deal, okay? Whatever they say, you're going to get them their favorite drink. You, when they show up, you're going to get them where they need to go, let them see what they want to see, get their kids to the right spot. When you sit down in this room, you're going to pray, God, would you open the eyes of my friend? Because what does Scripture say? The enemy wants to keep them blind to the gospel. So we need to pray against that in the name of Jesus. God, help them to have eyes to see and ears to hear. God, the person that you want me to invite, bump them into some friendly, enjoyable Christians. Come on, somebody. Keep them away from the grumpy ones. Ain't nobody got time for that. 
bump them into some, some enjoyable Christians that kind of just begin to prepare their heart. And Lord, when they come here, I promise you they're going to hear the gospel. I promise you God's going to do this thing. But we're praying for new life on Easter Sunday, all right? And so don't just show up just like it's any other Sunday. Uh, this is one of those times that even people who are far from God will darken the doors of a church on Easter Sunday. So let's be a part of that. Ladies, where's my ladies at? All right, all right, April 26th. April 26th, we have a women's conference happening, the Bridge Women's Conference. We have a new curriculum for you ladies that we're really, really, really excited about. This conference is gonna jumpstart that. So ladies, make sure April 26th, you can sign up Next Steps Desk, you can sign up online. Love for you to get connected. Fellas, where are you? Ooh, all right, all right, all right. Hey, make it easy for your lady to go, all right? Make it, just sign her up, sign her up. Say, babe, of course you're gonna go to that. And when she says, who's gonna watch the kids, you're gonna say, it ain't babysitting if I made them, all right? It ain't baby, say it with me, guys. It's not babysitting if they're your kids, okay? Okay, now ladies, listen to me real quick. Just <coughs> wrap your head around this. They're gonna get tater tots and chicken nuggets, all right? That's just... It's what it's going to be. We promise not let them watch R-rated movies. We're going to do our best to make sure that all the children are alive and well when you get home. Just trust God to work in our lives. Okay, now listen, ladies, that, that's a big deal. I uh, want you to make sure. Guys, we got one for you in June, but ladies first. Come on, somebody. All right, okay. <laughs> Lastly, discipleship one, D1. Uh, I'm just going to give it to you straight, y'all. Uh, I'm out of mentors, Okay. I'm out of mentors, particularly on the ladies' side, and, and so let's just have a quick family conversation, can we? All right. Uh, guys, we are a young 80-year-old church. That's who we are. That's what God has done in this church coming out of COVID, and I'm so grateful for that, but the reality of it is we have a lot of people who need to get discipled, and fellas, I need to talk to you real quickly on this. The ladies have really hopped on this. A lot of women are wanting to get discipled. We, we can't keep up with the ladies, but, but you fellas, uh, I'm not sure what we're waiting for, all right? Uh, God tells us to make disciples. God tells us to invest in somebody else's life. Um, I need you to get connected to this discipleship thing. And here, here's the urgency for this. One of the next steps uh, coming out of Easter, okay, how, how many of you believe that God's going to save people on Easter Sunday? You, you should be raising your hand, yeah. God saves people in this church every single Sunday, and I never want you to get used to that because that is a wild, wild, wild thing. I promise you that God's going to save people on Easter Sunday, but we need someone to disciple those people. And so I'm going to ask people, do you want to be discipled? And what I don't want is to have to say to them, hey, new believer, we're so glad God saved you, but we weren't ready for you. Okay? And so, fellas, uh, I need you to get connected to this. Uh, ladies, I need more lady mentors. Here is the prerequisite. You need to go to Growth Track, which is happening immediately following this service. We wanna make sure we are qualifying mentors so that we know you're on board and aligned with us. Um, but this is an enormous thing. God doesn't tell us to make church people. He tells us to make disciples. And D1 is the way that we do that. Now let me just say one last thing and then, and then we'll get to the book. Um, I've heard from a lot of you who have been here for a long time, well, I did the 16 lessons, okay? I did directions, and, and hear what I'm saying. Um, I did too. Uh, love them, God used them in my life. We're in a new time, in a new season. This content is not that same content. It doesn't intend to be. And so if you feel like, I don't need to do D1 because I did the 16 lessons, yes, you do. It's not the same thing, it's apples and oranges, and I need you to get connected to this so that we can receive the fruit that God's given to us. Say amen if you're with me on that. All right, I appreciate both of you saying that. I'm super confident. <laughs> yeah. All right, hey, let's pray, and uh, we'll get to it. God, we love you. And God, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the, the true statement. God, I don't, I don't have to massage this at all. You are saving people every single Sunday in this church. And uh, what an incredible thing that is. This is a, a young 80-year-old church, and, and you have... Really, through a difficult time, you are, you are remaking this church, and we are along for the ride that you have us on. So we're grateful, uh, Lord, but we want to be good stewards. And so I just pray that you'll be moving 
in our hearts and in our minds, use your word, use your Holy Spirit to make this church what you want it to be. You are in charge. It is yours. You bought it with your blood. And so bless this time, anoint this time, cover and protect this time for your glory and our joy. We love you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. My first job was McDonald's. I did not like it. <laughs> But I was 14 years old and I needed to get paid. You know what I'm saying? I needed to get paid. I need money for whatever 14 year olds need money for. And McDonald's was happy to help me on this endeavor. They agreed to pay me $4.25 an hour. Uh, so I was rich, rich, right? They gave me hundreds of dollars. Listen, if you do the math on 425, you work an eight hour shift, that's about 34 bucks. You work five days a week, it's 150 ish before taxes, like 110 bucks. For a 14 year old, I was completely loaded, completely loaded. <laughs> it was fantastic. But if I'm honest, when I started, um, I was there for me. I was there to get paid. I defined my work, I defined my performance. I had no concept of my other employees, of the betterment of them, of the betterment of McDonald's. I was just trying to get paid, which made me a terrible employee. Yeah. Now, it didn't take me long to observe a trend. Regardless of tenure or skill, I saw that there was really just two types of employee. As I looked around and I saw, why does that person seem to be doing well and even enjoying themselves, and that person who does the exact same job, not doing well and not enjoying themselves? Two employees. The first is people who, I confess, were like me. They were there for them. They worked as little as possible, were regularly confused or frustrated when passed over for promotion or new rules. The more they focused on themselves, the less others paid attention to them. It's an interesting dynamic that the more they focused on them, the less anybody else wanted to pay attention to them. Conversely, the other employee was not them-centered, they were customer-centered and other employee-centered. And these employees seemed to be enjoying themselves and they were regularly given promotion and regularly received raises. The less they focused on them, the more everybody else wanted to pay attention to them. One group says, pay attention to me, we don't want to pay attention to you. The other group says, I'll pay attention to you, now we want to pay attention to you. Now as I looked, took other jobs, uh, new markets, new cities, new jobs, same two employees showed up again and again and again. It's happened in enough jobs, in enough states, enough places for me that I've come to believe that it doesn't have anything to do with employees at all. It's just people. That there's really just two types of people. Certain people are here for them. Look at me and what I want and what I need, and if I have to use you to get what I want, I'm willing to do that. And I've noticed that over time, the people who focus on them, nobody wants to pay attention to them. Conversely, I've noticed that there are people who are there for others. That any room that they walk into, they're looking to bless somebody. They're looking to be a part of what's happening in that room. And I have noticed that the person who's focusing on them always has a friend. Always has somebody who wants to come alongside of them. Always, always is trying to elevate them. They're not being opposed because of their pride. They're being exalted because of their humility. And this is the argument that Paul is going to make to the church at Ephesus. Paul has turned the corner on the book of Ephesians. He has spent the first three chapters talking about everything that we have in Jesus. I told you that the book is divided into three categories, sit, walk, stand. The first three chapters, Paul doesn't talk about what you should do, he talks about what Jesus has done. He says you are seated in heavenly places. Just sit, just rest, there's nothing for you to do, Christian. Just receive who God is and who you are. Receive your identity. Chapter 4, therefore, walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called to. Sit, walk, and later we'll talk about stand. But Paul has been talking to us about everything that we have in Jesus. He starts chapter 4, therefore, when you're reading the Bible and you see therefore, you should ask, why is that there? What's that there for? He said last week, I want you to walk worthy Walk worthy, Christian, in light of everything that Jesus has done. Walk worthy of your calling. Walk worthy of your vocation. Walk worthy of the work that you are called to do. So let's pause for a second. In light of everything that God has done for you, 
If I just were to look at your life, and, and the word that Paul uses there, worthy, walk worthy, the word means estimable. Your life is an estimation of your value on what God has done for you. Walk worthy of the calling that you have been given. Your use of your calling estimates your value on what God has done. So if I were to look at your life and say, how are you doing with your calling? How are you doing with your ministry? How are you doing with the reason that God puts you on this planet? Are you walking worthy of what God has done? Or are you focused on other things? And it all happens to us. We get bogged down with the cares of this world. We get sleepy in our faith. We get apathetic about the church. I got money to make. I got spouses to marry. I got cars to drive. I got houses to build. I have tuition to pay. I got stuff to do. God says, I called you to something. Are you walking worthy of that calling? Paul isn't correcting the Ephesians. He's pastoring the Ephesians. And that's what I want to do with you today. Is I want to Use God's word to pastor us. Paul is saying, if you understood everything that God has done for you, if you understood everything that God not is accomplishing, has accomplished in your life, of course you would think that God is worthy of you fulfilling your calling. Of course you'd want to live for God. Of course, if you knew that Jesus paid with his blood for the church, you would want unity in the church. Of course you wouldn't want your life to be about you, you would want your life to be about others. You'd want to glorify God by loving your neighbor. So, of course, if you understood who Jesus was and who you are and what you have, of course you would want to do it God's way. That's what Paul's saying. It's not a corrective text, it's an assumptive text. Chapter one through three is the why. Why should I do this, Paul? Because of everything that Jesus has done. The beginning of chapter four is the what? What what do you want me to do? I want you to walk worthy of your calling. And our text today is the how. Are you all still with me? And let me just pause for a second. I wanna wanna do two things today. Uh, I'm I'm gonna less preach and I'm gonna more try to teach you through this text. It's a little tedious, so I wanna encourage you to take good notes. And the other thing that I wanna do is I wanna meddle in your life. Okay? Because I love you, and because I have been living with this text for three weeks, and Paul has been meddling in my life, I don't want to share in the joy of that, all right? (laughs) Here's our text, Ephesians 4 and verse 7, but grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way in him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined together and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself in love. I want to tell you today that you have more than you think. You have more than you think. This text lets us know that you have more abilities, supernatural ability, than you think that you have. The reason that I say that is that Paul says this grace, this gift, was given to each one of us. Now, Paul has already talked about grace. He had talked about the grace that saves us, the grace that allows us to be sons and daughters of God, the grace that seats us in heavenly places. He now transitions to the grace of being gifted. It's not salvific grace, it's the gift of grace. Every Christian in this room, don't miss this. If you're a follower of Jesus in the room, doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't even necessarily matter what you believe, what your tradition is, if you are in this room and you're a follower of Jesus, you have spiritual gifts. And those gifts are an indication of your calling because God doesn't call you to it without giving what you need to walk worthy of that calling. Your gifts are tied to your calling. Your calling is tied to your purpose. And Paul says, walk worthy of your calling. Now, he says something interesting. He gets into this. 
parenthetic, uh, kind of odd text in Ephesians chapter 4. He says that Jesus led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. He's quoting Psalm 68 here. And the idea is that Jesus on the cross achieved a victory. Psalm 68 is a text that we refer to as Christus Victor, the victory of Christ. That on the cross, Jesus didn't just achieve a victory that means if you pray a prayer, you get to go to heaven when you die. Rather, that on the cross and on Easter, Jesus renewed and everything and defeated sin and death permanently. That he stepped on the face, as it were, Genesis chapter 3, of Satan on the cross. Psalm 68 is talking about David achieving a military victory and walking POWs, defeated foes, and loot from his victory through the city that he was inhabiting. And Paul is essentially saying, on the cross, Jesus went to hell, stole the house keys, went to heaven, and walked defeated foes through heavenly estate with the spiritual loot, so to speak, in tow. It's an interesting idea. It's also clear that Paul is referencing a liturgical custom in the synagogues at the time which took Psalm 68 and connected it with the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the Jews commemorated Moses' ascent, important word, up to Sinai, and his descent with the gift of the law. And Jesus says that Jesus is our true and better Moses who ascends to heaven, and then the Spirit descends and doesn't give us the gift of the law, but through grace gives us the gift of gifts. Everyone has gifts. Why? Because Jesus won. Everybody in this room has gifts. Everybody in this room is a follower of Jesus. You have something that God gave you, something of infinite value because it took an infinite act to create that value that God gives to you for free. Your salvation is free and so are your gifts in Jesus. And because you have those gifts, here it is, not only do you have more abilities than you think, you have more responsibility than you think. I I find, especially in America, that we take a a very passive, a very optional view of the church. Can I tell you, fellas, I've already been in your face a little bit, so why stop now? (laughs) Since COVID, most men attend church 1.3 times a month. And ladies, before you get to, oh, (laughs) you attend 1.8 times a month. Most of you have read your Bible less than one time this week. Now you pray it every day because you need stuff. Come on, let's call it what it is. And when you do come to church, you attend church and you come in and you kind of sit there and, oh, that was good today, not good today. I liked it. I didn't like it. Why was Tim wearing that? Why can't he grow hair? I don't know. All right. (laughs) But you're taking an, an observational perspective of the church. Can I tell you, God doesn't passively gift you. He actively gifts you. 1 Corinthians 12, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit, here it is, for the common good. If you have gifts, those gifts are for the common good. Those gifts aren't for you. They weren't giving them to you because you earn them, and they aren't giving them to you for you to hang on to. They are given them to you actively so that you can actively use them for the common good where? In the church. In the church. You got more than you think. You got more ability, but you also have more responsibility. God says these gifts are gifts of grace, meaning God doesn't give the best Christians the best gifts. We don't receive gifts and say, hey, look at me and my gifts. No, no, we receive these gifts with the same humility that we received our salvation. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Paul's already talked about this. You don't get saved by works, and you don't give gifts by works. You get saved by grace, and you get gifts by grace. And when you use those gifts, I don't experience you. I experience the grace of God in you to me. This is a powerful thing, if you'll think about it, that when you use your gifts that God gave you for the common good of others, they don't experience you, they experience God. 
And because of that, we should be generous with our gifts. In other words, I don't make demands before I'm willing to use my gifts. Pastor, I'd be happy to do that if you would just... Or if you would stop. You know, the other day, this happened, I didn't like that, so I decided that I'm going to take my talents elsewhere. (laughs) We'll go on then. Because those gifts... You didn't earn them, and those gifts aren't for you, so you're not going to hold us hostage with them. I'll just stop coming. Okay. This is not my job to maintain the membership of Graceway. It's my job to equip the membership of Graceway. So we don't hold on to our gifts. We don't sit there full of potential and full of ability, knowing that God gave them to me for you, and say, no, I'm going to come to church 1.3 because I'm really, I'm really, really busy. No, 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 no. When you understand the price that was paid to save you and to gift you, of course you would want to fulfill the calling that God has on your life. That's what Paul's saying. Now, Paul goes into an interesting kind of teaching around, around gifts. He gives us some categories of gifts. So let me, let me just walk you through this real quickly, as, as quickly and as simply as I can. In the Bible, there's a distinction between spiritual gifts and spiritual offices. So let's talk about gifts first. I want to teach you what spiritual gifts are by teaching you what they aren't. It's a bit more clarifying. So number one, spiritual gifts are not natural abilities, meaning LeBron James does not have the spiritual gift of dunking. Okay, he just happens to be six foot eight and 260 pounds and apparently very healthy into his old age, right? And naturally. Okay, anyways. um, There are certain things that we have that we have been educated in or we uh, have physiological or intellectual ability around, those aren't spiritual gifts. I've watched people who are great public speakers, you put a Bible in their hand and they're speechless. Yeah, because it's not, it's not the same thing. They're not natural abilities. Number two, spiritual gifts are not character traits. Understand the difference between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. The gifts are supernatural abilities that the Spirit gives you in grace. Fruit of the Spirit is the character that the indwelling Holy Spirit is creating in you. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Pastor, I don't have the spiritual gift of joy. No, you're just rude. Yeah. No, no, character being developed in you undergirds the spiritual gifts that God has given you, but they're not the same thing. Thirdly, spiritual gifts are not a position. You have somebody at work, the boss comes and said, here's the deal, this is what we're going to do, blah, blah, blah. And you turn to somebody and you say, what are we really going to do? And even though that person has the position, that person's the leader. Now, ideally, the gift and the position are one and the same. But a position does not make a gift, and a gift does not always create a position. And then fourthly, gifts are not self-advancement. I want to do that thing, so I say I have that gift. That's not how it works. Remember, God sovereignly chooses what gifts he gives, God in his grace gives you those gifts, not for you, but for what the church needs. Okay, so let me tell you what gifts are as just straight up as I can give it to you. Uh, Spiritual gifts are a ministry that you love when you do, number one. Uh, Think about the individuals. I I always, our, our band always sounds great, but I'm always interested in a very simple thing. Do they look like they are enjoying what they're doing. Have you ever been to a church when somebody's worshiping God, but their face don't know? <laughs> One of the things that I love about our worship team is that I believe them even if I couldn't hear them. They love doing it. No one's making them do this, right? They're not up here because they're like, if you don't do this, we're going to... No, no, no. They, they love doing it. That's the first. The second is, we love when you do it. Okay, so go back to the same here, all right? Let, let's, let's take Caleb, who led our last song with his fantastic pocket tie today, or his uh, pocket square today. Um, let's say that, that Caleb was sitting up here, and the reason that he's sitting up here is because he told Pastor Brandon, Pastor Brandon, man, I love to sing. Option, you know, prerequisite number one. What, what should Pastor Brandon's next question be? Yeah, but do we love when you sing? Yeah, because some of you, you love to sing, but can I just tell you, I feel like I'm being waterboarded when I listen to you sing. (laughs) 
I'm not saying you wouldn't feel like you were being waterboarded when I sang, but I'm not up here trying to sing, okay? Yeah, yeah, because a gift, if the gift is for me, just because you like to do it doesn't preclude my involvement in it. You love to do it, I love when you do it, and when you do it, it works, number three. So watch, whenever this team sings those songs, what do you wanna do? You wanna sing with them, and that's the point. Can I tell you, I don't wanna worship Jesus when I listen to Adele. I love listening to Adele. She's got a ridiculous, ridiculous voice. I'm not, look, I'm not too proud to say it. I listen to Adele, all right? <laughs> but I don't want to worship Jesus when I listen to Adele. Why? Because that is a natural ability, not a spiritual gift. You love to do it. We love when you do it. It works when you do it. Okay, now offices are different than gifts in a very simple way. An office is somebody with a gift and the desire and gift to equip others with that gift. Okay, can I, let's just say this. Um, I'm not the godliest person at Graceway. I'm not. Um, I'm not the holiest. I don't pray the most. Uh, You say, well, then why are you the pastor? If you're the pastor, you're supposed to be the godliest, the holiest, the most sanctified, the other word. No, no, no. I'm just using my gifts for what? To equip you. That, that's why I have this office. What, what is a pastor, a leader, a dream team leader, somebody with a gift? No, no, no. Somebody with a gift and the desire and ability to equip others with the gift. That's why I say to my staff very regularly, I'm not paying you to do. I'm paying you to equip. The congregation is the one who does the ministry, not, not the pastor. <coughs> the pastor, what does Paul say? equips the saints for ministry. That's my part on the team. Doesn't make my part any more important than your part. If you go to growth track, which I hope that you will, you hear me say, when we stand before God, the crossing guard who thought that that was his ministry and I are gonna get the same crown. Because he was doing what he's called to do, with all the strength that he could do it, and I'm doing what I'm called to do. I'm playing my part, and so is he or she. The greeter, the coffee maker, the kids worker, the singer, the speaker. I'm not any better or holier. This is just me using my gifts. Are you with me? So Paul's going to lay out for us four roles. Remember that gift office swing here. Okay, the first is... God gives apostles. God gives apostles. So there's an office of an apostle in the Bible. It's an authoritative office. It's a foundational office. I actually think that the apostles had all of the spiritual gifts, all of the gifts, because I think God used them to jumpstart the church. There was probably 13 or 14 of them, not more. One of the reasons that I say that is that the office had requirements, not only gift requirements, but some experience requirements. One of them is that you had to have seen the risen Jesus Christ with your own eyes. Okay, Acts 1 and Acts 10 says this, so let's just call it what it is. You're on YouTube and somebody says, hi, I'm Apostle Tim Dunn. One of two things is true. Either I have an incredible Botox doctrine plan because I'm about 2,000 years old. Or, I'm not an apostle, okay? The office of an apostle had requirements to it. Now, the gifting, an apostolic gifting, I think still is in play. Apostolic leaders are leaders of other leaders who pioneer new works. Okay, so whenever I take a spiritual gift test, apostolic leadership shows up on my thing. I love spending time around leaders. I love trying to push the future kingdom into the present as far as it'll go. But I'm not an apostle, you hear what I'm saying? Because I, I, Jesus has been, been gone for a long time. I ain't seen him. I'm hoping to see him soon. Are you with me? God gave apostles. God gave prophets. Now, there was an office of a prophet. They were foretellers. They were individuals that God gave direct revelation to. They served as the mouthpiece of God, which is why God says, if somebody says they're speaking for me and they're wrong, stone them and then set them on fire. God don't play with his word. In the office of a prophet, if you were wrong, we assigned the wrongness, not to the prophet, 
oh, God must have told you the wrong thing. So God said, if somebody says they're a prophet, there are requirements for that office. Now, in the New Testament, it's interesting because even though I would say the office of a prophet as a foreteller does not exist, that since we have the completed work of Scripture, there are two ways a prophetic gifting shows up. The one is what I would call a seer, okay? Somebody who can see things as they are. Have you ever had this experience? Somebody comes up to you and they say something, you say, bro, there's no way that you can know that. Yeah, that's a prophetic gift. Now, you should test that gift. That's what Scripture says. You should make sure that you bear witness to that gift. Why? Because just because somebody says they've heard from God doesn't mean that they have. But sometimes I've had people say, bro, I I feel like God wanted me to tell you. And that's a great way to start that. I feel like God wanted me to tell you. Now, I could be wrong, but I feel like God said for you this. Does that make sense to you? That's a prophetic biblically prophetic statement. I'm not telling you this is what God says. I I am bearing witness to what I think God is saying to me. That's a prophetic gifting, not a prophetic office. Or there are individuals who have a prophetic gifting in that they take the revelation of God's word and they apply it to your life. General revelation, specific revelation. So again, I've had people come, pastor, Every time you preach, I feel like you're preaching exactly to me. Can I tell you? That's not me. I don't even know you. I don't don't even know your name. That's God's word. That's God's word. You have people in your life who are using gifts, not offices, gifts. Thirdly, Paul says he gives us evangelists. These are the OBGYNs of the church, always collecting new life. Come on. Here we go. Yeah? Yeah? Listen, I got people in my life, they walk into Starbucks for a coffee, and they walk out of Starbucks with a spiritual convert. It's like, what? I'm just here for the espresso. Like, what? I have a friend everywhere I go with him. His name's Chris Harper. He's been on this stage. If if you are in a room with Chris, you're going to be friends with Chris. And I've watched him give the gospel over and over and over. He has the gift of evangelism. Now, God calls all of us, commands all of us to be evangelists. But he supernaturally imparts power to certain individuals. He gives them evangelism giftings. Are you with me? And then most of your gifts are going to fall under shepherd and teacher. OBGYN, the evangelist, if, if that's the case, shepherd and teacher is like family practice talks, okay? So shepherds care, counseling, instruction, administration, most of your gifts are going to fall into that. Uh, teachers, different scale, different setting, not just standing up on the stage teaching, uh, teaching growth track, um, teaching a class at midweek, teaching your kids right now while you're in here, all using spiritual gifts. Everyone in here has a gift. And then thirdly, most of this, don't, don't freak out about the time, most of this I'm just going to teach you through the text, all right? And, and then lastly, your gifts aren't for having, your gifts are for giving, Your gifts aren't for having, your gifts are for giving. You have more than you think, categories of gifts, and then your gifts aren't for having, your gifts are for giving. Uh, What does that mean? Paul says your gifts are for the equipping of the saints for ministry and the building up of the body of Christ. Um, Paul says that equipping and that building is toward unity. Okay, so um, can I tell you, there are people here who invest in this church, they use their gifts, they show up and they do what God has created and called them to do. And do you know how I feel about them? I love them, why? Because they are blessing something that I love and I'm trying to invest in as well. And what do we call that? Unity. We call that unity. If you're on the dream team here at at Graceway, I pray for you every single day. I'm so grateful for you because you love something that I love. You are serving something that I'm serving and it creates something for me, in me, towards you, even though I've never met you. Now, if you're coming and you're observing, I'm glad that you're here, but can I just tell you, it ain't the same. It isn't the same. Next, it's toward maturity. So God says that when I use my gifts, God matures me as I use them. Uh, You might not think I'm a great teacher now, but man, you should have heard me when I started. Whew. I'm a lot better now. 
Yeah, yeah, as you get, use your gifts, you get matured in your gifts. Some of y'all, you've had your gift for years and years and years, and it's like a newborn baby in your life because you don't use it. And what's interesting is that I'm being matured as I use my gifts, and you're being matured as I use my gifts, and it equips you to use yours. Are you with me? Next, God uses your gifts to make the church look more like Jesus. Because when I lay my life down for the church and I serve the church and I bless the church, not only am I unified with Christ's heart, not only am I looking more like Jesus, but I am growing in who God says them. The fullness of Christ in my life is what Paul says. And then lastly, Paul says, you using your gifts creates unity, maturity, um, fullness, and stability. Yeah. And the result of you using your gifts is the body grows in, in, in love. Listen, this is the church that you want to be a part of. You want to be a part of a unified church, right? You want to be a part of a mature church, right? You want to be a part of a church that looks like Jesus, treats people like Jesus, right? You want to be a part of a church that's stable. You don't want to be a part of a church that every time we turn around, there's another drama, trauma, tragedy, transition. You want stability. You want a church that's growing, right? You want a church that's loving, right? Okay, you have abilities and responsibilities. That's what Paul says. You see, most of us want that to be given to us, and Paul says you are the gift to it. You are a part of making this church what it becomes. So let's talk practically, and then I'll be in my seat. Are you still with me? Okay. Um. You can't become everything God wants you to be without the church. You cannot become everything that God wants you to be without the church. You say, well, I don't like this church. Please hear me. Then let me help you find another one. I've done that many times over my years here. I know this church isn't for everyone. I'm not, I don't always like me. Come on, all right? But you, you cannot lay hold to the plans and promises of God in your life without the church. Paul doesn't teach it in a positive way. He teaches it almost in a negative way. So let's say it this way. You can't be equipped without the church. You you say, no, no, I listen to podcasts. (laughs) Listen, if you think the only equipping at this church happens on Sunday morning, you're misunderstanding what's happening. You have an innumerable amount of opportunities to be equipped in your faith, not just in this room, Walking out to the lobby in the parking lot when somebody cuts you off. Everything at church is intended to instruct and to equip you. Watch all the podcasts you want. It is not a replacement for participation in the church. Number two, you can't be mature without the church. Because again, we're not just consuming information. No, no, no. I'm growing through the interactions that make the church what it is. Listen, you came to church today. You came to, the church came to the building. You didn't come to church. The church came to the building. And you can't be growing, I don't mean without this building, you can't be growing without the push and pull, the tensions, the struggle, the conflict that happened from us trying to do life together. Listen, you can't grow without some resistance in your life. You can't experience the fullness of God without the church. That's God's plan. You say, well, that's frustrating. I know. I know. Wouldn't it be easier? Wouldn't it be easier? And you can't be stable and strong without the church. Listen, some of y'all keep testing this theory. (laughs) You, You men, you come one time a month. You send your wife. And you want your family to be strong. Come on, what are we talking about? You're the spiritual head of your home. You're the spiritual leader of your home. She should be trying to keep up with you, not the other way around. Listen, I'm I'm gonna be real straight with you. We we got a prayer team, I lead the prayer team. It's 90% women. Why, guys? Where are you? Where are you at? The church needs you, and you need the church. And, and, And you attending isn't, it isn't enough. Now, it makes you better than most other Christians. Sure, great, I'm glad. Uh, but, but some of you, you, you don't show up for six months and, and, and you pop in when the pressure on your life gets big enough 
instead of being a part of this body. And just look around, it's all the ladies clapping. You, don't, you can turn the music off, I'm not done. All right. Listen, you, you, no, seriously, I'm not done. My notes, I'm not. <laughs> I meant about my notes. Uh, my notes, all right? I'm not putting anyone blast. Listen, you, you, can't be, you can't be strong if you're not a part of the church. You can't be blessed if you're not a part of the church. You can't be equipped if you're not a part of the church. Okay, and, and number two, you need to know your gifts so that you can use your gifts. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 1 now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Okay, and, and this is where I, I want to I pass you. Pre-COVID, 83% of Christians didn't know what their gifts were. If you don't know your gifts, you can't know your calling. If you don't know your calling, you can't know your purpose. This is the reason that Growth Track exists, guys. Growth Track isn't a new members class. Growth Track is we teach you about God, we teach you about the church, we teach you about you. That's what it is. Because, because I believe that God wants everybody in this room to walk worthy of the calling, and I believe if you don't know that calling, you can't walk worthy of it. So, so let's talk real quickly, okay? Can I tell you, part of our disillusionment, disillusionment with the church is just the brokenness of humanity. It, it just is. It, you, listen, you put 2,000 people in a room together, something's bound to go wrong. <laughs> if I'm God, I don't make church the plan. I'll be honest with you. So the reality of it is, and I say this to you a lot, you don't have church baggage. You have, you have baggage with somebody you went to church with. And it's fair, because people are crazy. <laughs> people are crazy. She stands up. The only time she stands up is when I said people are crazy. Pe people, people do things. We get hurt in church. But we also need to understand that part of our delusionment with the church is spiritual warfare. Paul says... Your beef isn't with the person you went to church with. It's with, this, with the principality and power undergirding that. Some of you, some of you you're, you're not connected to a church because of the church you used to attend. Uh, can I also tell you a part of your disillusionment with the church is that you're watching when you should be participating. You're never going to love the church you just attend. You're, I, I'm just, uh, hear me. You're never going to love a wife you don't go on a date with. You're not. You're not. You're never going to love kids that you're only their unpaid Uber driver. You have to, your, your heart follows your treasure, Matthew 6 says. If you want to love a church, you've got to invest in the church. And the reality of it is, it's still not enough. You still might get hurt at this church. Why? Because I'm here. Because they're here. Because they're, like, this is, we just got to call this what it is. But we need you to know your gifts because, because you're never going to use what you don't know about. 1 Peter 4, each has received the gift. Use it to serve one another as God's stewards, as good stewards of God's varied grace. Okay. Let, um, let, me, let me say this and then I'm going to be done. Okay. I feel like the Lord's telling me to stop talking. Um, Matthew 9. Um, Matthew 9. Is a, is a really instructive text to me. Um, Jesus is looking out on a crowd of people. Are you all still with me? Yeah. Give me two minutes and I'm in my seat. Um, Jesus sees the crowd and he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You know, I, I watch the news and I get on social media and I don't think there's a better description of the world right now than harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus' response to that isn't criticism, it's compassion. And Jesus, seeing this, says this. He's talking to the disciples, he says, the harvest is plentiful, yo. This is such a powerful thing that, that the world so desperately needs Jesus because the world is so desperately broken. And Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but I just want you to hear this. This is Jesus speaking, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. That's Jesus, by the way. Jesus says, ask me. Ask me to send laborers into the harvest. And, and that's what I want to ask you to do this week. 
Um, in Isaiah chapter 6, God is looking around and he says, uh, whom shall I send and who will go for us? <laughs> and Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Um, this, this next Sunday, y'all, is Easter Sunday. And if statistics are correct, 80% of people, four out of five people, if you are their friend and you invite them to church, they will come. We always say, I'm afraid to be rejected. I'm, I'm just telling you, four out of five people aren't going to reject you. Um, we're living in a world right now, and, and I'm, I, I'm walking around this year with so much concern about where our country is, so much concern about where the church is. We're in this election year that is bound to be wild. But what, what's really happening, it's sheep without a shepherd. That's what it is. And Jesus says, hey, hey, church, I would love, I would love, there we go. I, <laughs> I, would, I would love for you to stop attending church and start being the church. I would love for you to stop saying you're a member at Graceway just because you darken its doors a couple times a month. And I would love for you to begin to labor in the calling that God saved you to. Can I tell you, you need the church to grow and we need you to grow. We need your work for the work that God has called us to and you need our work for the work that God has called you to. I wanna ask you this week to ask God to help you to see things as they actually are. And instead of thinking to yourself, oh, that's interesting, please do something about it. I'm gonna ask you that the things that you see at Graceway that you don't love, don't complain, don't gossip, don't slander, please do something about it. The only way we get where God wants us to go is if we do it together. Unified, being matured, looking more like Jesus, stabilized and strengthened in what God wants to do, but I need you and you need me. God's gonna give us a harvest this Easter. Let's be laborers in that harvest, amen? God, I love you tonight. I love you this morning. I thank you for saving me as a 16-year-old kid and for giving me gifts that I didn't deserve. And Lord, you have literally let me go all over this planet using those gifts. And Lord, what a privilege it is. There's nothing in my life that I would rather do than what I get to do. And Lord, I want that to be true for everybody in this room. I want them to get up anticipating. I want them to get up on purpose. I want them to get up and see the world as it is and labor in the field. I ask you, Lord, to make us an active church, an active membership church, a participating church, an investing church, Lord. And that as we do that, you'll meet us in the work that you've called us to. You'll be glorified in the work that you've called us to and that you'll accomplish incredible things in the work that you've called us to. We love you, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here's what I wanna to say to you, all right? Um, if you're in this room and you're not a Christian, I want you to know that God has more for you. I want you to know that God's created you for more than you could possibly imagine, but you laying hold of that begins with surrender. You laying hold of everything that God has for you begins with surrender. And so if you're in this room, I never want to fail to give this invitation. And you're not a Christian. I want to pray a prayer and I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me and then we'll go home. Dear Jesus, thank you for creating me and for loving me even when I've ignored you and gone my own way. I know that I need you in my life. I'm sorry for my sins against you and others. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again. You are God and I am not. I ask you to forgive me as much as I know how. I'm ready to change direction by giving you my life. I'm ready to follow you from now on and do what you want me to do. Please come into my life and make me new on the inside. Help me to grow so that I can be like you. And everyone keep your eyes closed for a minute. If that's you and you are not a Christian, but today you want to surrender your life, your heart to Jesus, I want you to just raise your hand. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to have you stand up. I'm just going to have somebody come down and give you a Bible. All the promises of God begin with surrender. Here at Graceway, we want you to get everything that God has for you. And if you 
got that Bible, I want you to fill out that card because you just made the most important decision of your life and I don't want you to take the next steps alone. So stop at the next steps desk, come down front for prayer, let somebody pray for you. Come on church, we thank God for new life in the house today. And if you walked in here and you're harassed, you're heavy, I want you to come down, let us pray for you, let us be a blessing to you. If you haven't gone to Growth Track, go to it noon on the other side of that wall. If you came prepared to give, you can do it. Grace, well, I love you. God's going to do incredible things this week. Let's join what he's doing. Have the best week. I'll see you at Good Friday. Thank you for being a part of our service today. We believe God wants you to discover your purpose so that you can make a difference to those around you. Go to visitgraceway.org slash growth track to learn more about growth track and learn how you can join us. Sign up for our weekly text newsletter to learn more about what is happening at Graceway by going to graceway.app slash hello. If you heard something today that you would like to learn more about or would like to pray with someone today, call or text us at 816-423-2877 to speak to one of our pastors. Be sure to click like or subscribe to get the latest videos and live streams from Graceway every week. Have a great week.